afternoon. Uh, I always dreamt of being on stage at Second City. Um, so uh, why did the chicken cross the road? This is my CX joke. Why did, the, why did the chicken cross the road? Well, that depends on the persona. Yeah. This is why I focus on research and not comedy. So uh, my name is Augie Ray, Senior Director of Customer Experience Research at Gartner. The thing about CX is that while it is a hot term, don't have to tell you that, it is under attack. Uh, we are beginning to see organizations really struggle with it. And when they struggle with it, largely because they're not doing it right, they make decisions that are contrary, we think, to the health of the brand and the company. So, for instance, uh, Gartner is now predicting that by 2022, CMOs, who for years have said that customer experience is their highest priority, will begin to turn away from customer experience. And as a result, we are forecasting a 25% decrease in marketing-funded CX efforts. Now, our friends at Forrester are seeing the same thing. They just had a prediction that they have published saying that they expect 20% of organizations will turn away from CX, the throw in the towel is a term they use, and stop trying to differentiate based on their customer experience. So we clearly have a real problem here. And what I would like to do is try to help, uh, help you solve it at your organizations as we do with our clients. So the thing that we observe, which is pretty obvious, let's start with something obvious here, which is companies, when they try to approach CX, will rely on doing things that are easy over complex, things that are safe over risky, and ultimately, they end up providing the expected experience instead of the profound experience. Now, before I get going, one thing I would like to ask all of you to do is to right now take 30 seconds and think about two or three brands that you love. I'm not going to ask anyone to shout them out. Just two or three brands that you think have provided a great experience. As a result, you are loyal to them. You tell others about them. Two or three brands. I'm going to refer to them periodically here. Does everyone have two or three brands? Not if you do. Now, the thing about those brands is that they did not rely on easy and safe and expected. So what we want to do is begin to violate that and to give the tools to CX leaders to be able to do something more profound. Now, the thing is, is that we know that experience matters. We know that disruption occurs. None of us need to see this slide. We've got Netflix versus Blockbuster, Amazon versus Sears, Apple versus Blackberry. And if I look at this, one of the things that I think is that if I had this slide in 1997, I would be drinking on the beach instead of speaking to you here today. But the point of this is that everyone thinks that Netflix and Amazon and Apple have in fact succeeded because of technology. But if you listen to their leaders, they say something else. They all say they started with customer experience and worked back to the technology. And so one of the things that we want to do is to find a way to not offer technology-based experiences that are solutions in search of a problem, but to reverse that, to make sure that we are starting with what our clients and our customers want and need and expect and provide that. So first off, I find that it really helps to begin to define what customer experience is. You find this, I'm sure, when you talk to your peers and you talk to your family when they ask what it is you do, and everyone's got a different opinion. So we see customer experience as two sides of one coin. The first side, which is the important side, is the customer side, and that's customer experience. It is their perceptions and related feelings that they accumulate across every touch point. And the thing that I like to point out, and again, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but clients often forget that they have a customer experience whether they want it or not. It doesn't matter whether you plan for it or optimize for it or measure it. it doesn't matter whether, even whether you want it or not, you have a customer experience. And so you may as well work to improve it. Which brings us to the other side of that coin, which is our side, customer experience management. And it is the discipline of designing and reacting to customer interactions in order to lift and exceed expectations. And this is the important part, improve satisfaction, loyalty, and advocacy. This is one of the things that we drive home to our clients about what makes CX different. I'm going to use those terms a lot, satisfaction, loyalty, and advocacy. So today, a lot of brands are like this young guy here. They keep whacking at the CX uh, game, and they never ring the bell for their clients. And uh, the thing is, is that most clients are just like this young guy. He can swing that mallet as much as he wants all day long. He's never going to ring the bell. He's not prepared. He's not playing the right game. He doesn't have enough force. He's not aiming right. 
all those problems. And that's exactly the same thing that we see with our clients. And so what we're going to do today is try to solve these things, at least maybe hopefully uh, give you a few tools that you might find useful. And I'm always open to your feedback. My uh, Twitter handle's on the bottom if you want to uh, offer any constructive criticism after we're done. But we're going to talk about that CX is underperforming where it matters most, and that is for the customer. Second of all, we're going to talk about how brands struggle to make these really important experiences real, the ones that are meaningful, the ones that are differentiated, and what we can do to solve that. And lastly, even if they do that, they still have another challenge, which is how do we measure the success of those important experiences in a way that earns support on an ongoing basis from our bosses. So CX is underperforming where it matters most. Right now, the thing that we see is that CX is like an upside down pyramid. It's resting on its point, which means it is very shaky. And the reason I say that is that our research demonstrates that most marketers will say that they understand that their brand is gonna compete on the basis of CX in the future, which is great. But only about half have established the rationale for CX. Only half can tell their bosses why CX matters. And if you can't do that, very hard to continue to retain budget and support. About the same percent uh, are executing effectively. 47% say that they have customer journey maps and they are especially effective in helping them to identify and prioritize their CX efforts. Um, even lower than that, only about two in five say that they are consistently meeting uh, and exceeding management's expectations. And on the bottom, just one in five say that they exceed customers' expectations. So the very reason we do CX, which is the meet and exceed expectations, and it's sitting here on the bottom. And the thing that I think is especially telling is, how does anyone meet management's expectations in CX without meeting customers' expectations? How does that happen? It demonstrates that we've got a problem in understanding. All right. So what are we gonna do about that? Well, Essentially, one of the big challenges that you probably face day to day and we help our clients with is that there are two sides to this challenge. We've got the business side, we've got the customer side. Business expects dollars, they want to improve margin, the customers expect satisfaction, and they want you to always be improving how you satisfy their needs. And ultimately, the way we measure these two things are very different. The business side is measured in lagging or coincident measures. What is our conversion rate on the site? What, how much money did we make last quarter? But customer experience measures are all leading indicators of success. As we lift satisfaction, loyalty, and advocacy, we create stronger relationships and we improve future results. So there's this problem between how do we speak the language of customers to leaders who care about the language of business. Now, to deal with this, many CX leaders begin to tilt. They begin to look at the business outcomes that people want. And what happens is that a lot of CX programs begin to be focused on how, many costs, how much cost savings can we deliver and how much acquisition can we add. Those are the business results that business leaders want. But the problem is that there's a lot of ways to cut costs and to improve acquisition that actually harm the customer. And so if we only focus on those business outcomes, we in fact lose sight of the customer, the whole reason we do it in the first place. So it might seem that then the answer is to go the other way, to be really focused on the customer metrics. But the problem here is that raising satisfaction or net promoter score or your customer effort score or any of the operational metrics that you have around CX is great, but it doesn't pay the bills. And so there's a problem. And if all you do is focus there, then you don't make it matter to business leaders. And this is, as we talked about at the top of the session, where you begin to lose support. So we talk about trying to help our customers bring balance. How do you focus on the customer and make it matter to the business? And a very simple approach, which is great if you have the data, is to begin to focus on, do your more satisfied customers deliver more value for the organization? To use the language of net promoter score for a second, are your promoters spending more, spending more often? Do they have a lower cost to serve? Do they have a higher lifetime value? Are they retained more versus churning? Do they tell others? Do they refer more business? These are all the business KPIs that business leaders care about. And so if we can make them care about satisfaction to understand how many unsatisfied customers that they have and what the difference in business outcomes are to satisfied customers, you begin to tear down that wall and bring balance. 
Now that's a very easy and simple way of saying something that's relatively complex, but you get the idea. And so the first thing that we always want to be doing with our clients is helping them to understand how to get people to care about CX. Because ultimately, if you talk about the importance of customer satisfaction or experiences in your organization, no one will disagree with you. No one stands up in a meeting and says, you know what, we should not improve customer satisfaction. No one ever does that. Everyone always gives lip service, but when you want budget, when you want to start challenging the status quo, this is when you run into issues and you need to be able to make it matter to the bottom line. All right, so that brings us to the brands are really struggling to deliver these really differentiating and meaningful experiences. All of this attention on CX and how many brands are really succeeding meaningfully. Some, you all have brands in your mind that do. So the problem that we see today is that brands are really playing whack-a-mole. Customer experience groups are playing whack-a-mole, and that is they see all the problems and they whack them as quickly as possible. And as quickly as you see a problem and you solve it, another one pops up and you're forever just finding problems and fixing them. And let's face it, brands need to do that. You need to find problems, you need to fix problems, but that is not what will differentiate the brand. Fixing problems is table stakes, it is not differentiating. And so what we wanna do is get out of playing whack-a-mole and begin to shift our perspective. Now, this will come as no surprise to anyone once again. Our research demonstrates that business leaders say that they understand that they have to create new innovative experiences, but my question always is, if everyone knows this, why do brands suck at it so much? All right, so what I wanna do is introduce a framework called the customer experience pyramid. And the idea here is that each layer of the pyramid is a different sort of experience, each more powerful than the rest, that helps to build relationships. I'm gonna be using a metaphor here of a flat tire and just talking about how each level impacts the experience of changing your tire. Now, you can and should be thinking about your brand, your company, your products and services, and inserting that into that metaphor. Also think about those brands that you were holding in your, in your brain. Where are they playing? So on the bottom is furnish me information I can use. Content is absolutely vital. Getting the right information to the right people at the right time and the right channel, all those things that we hear about all the time, absolutely vital. So if somebody has a flat tire and they can't find the instructions, they don't know how to change the tire, they can't find the jack, that's a disaster. But the thing about content is this is that it still puts the onus on the customer. The customer has to find the content, they have to consume the content, they have to understand the content, they have to act on the content. Content puts the onus on the customer. And so I don't care how great your instructions are for changing the tire, I don't care if you get Chris Pratt to do the funniest video making changing tires seem like the greatest experience ever, you're still squatting in the gutter changing your own tire. So content is vital, but it's at the base of our pyramid. Now the next step up is solve your problem when I ask. And here I'm in the voice of the customer. So your problem is the company's problem. So if I'm on the phone with a, uh, having a problem and talking to your customer service reps, or if I'm on Twitter complaining about your brand, what is your problem? I'm your problem. You want me to hang up and let you save some costs and you want me off of Twitter to stop raising the risks of some sort of an adverse brand impression. And so that's where a lot of organizations play, which is when people have problems, they try to deal with it as efficiently as possible to do the minimum necessary. So if I have a flat tire and I am paying for a roadside assistance service, they show up, they take the flat tire off, they throw it in the trunk, they take that tiny little 50 mile an hour tire, put it on the car, and then they drive away. They've done the minimum necessary. They have responded to my call, but I still have to get the tire fixed. It's not a great experience. Which is why the next level up is re resolve my needs when I ask. Now resolving needs takes something more. That isn't just responding to the initial request, it's not rushing people off the phone. Resolving needs means listening and understanding. So if that same roadside assistance service shows up, they repair the tire, they put it back on, and now I drive away completely whole, they have resolved my needs. That is a much better experience. Now there are brands that operate at this level, and we're only about halfway up our pyramid, that are really effective at differentiating themselves with experience, being really committed to understanding the needs of customers and resolving those needs. So one example, I was just talking to Ray earlier about USAA. 
I worked there for 18 months, great company. Didn't so much like San Antonio. But the thing about USAA is that in a category that earns no praise, no one raves about their bank or financial service or insurance company very much, USAA does. It earns some of the highest net promoter scores of any brand in the entire United States. Now, one of the reasons they do so is that when you call, they staff so that they pick up the phone quickly and they will take the time necessary to understand what you need. And they never just answer the question you have. One of the prototypical experiences of USAA is somebody who calls in and says, I need to change my address. And the person on the phone will say, I hear a kid back there. I don't see that you have any children on your life insurance. Oh yeah, we had children. Well, let's add that. Next thing you know, they're talking about whether you've got the right uh, college savings in place. Now, all of this is good for USAA, but it's great for their customers, or as they call them, members as well. They overcommit. They have a kind of staffing that most organizations would be aghast at. Now, another great example. Let me ask, first of all, how many of you had USAA in mind when I asked about great brands? Anybody? A couple, all right. Um, another brand that often gets mentioned is Zappos. Any of you think, have Zappos in mind? Now, the thing about Zappos is that Zappos also is known for great customer care. They want to make sure that people connect when, they, when you call in. Do you know, anyone know what the longest ever Zappos customer care phone call was? Anyone want to guess? Throw out something. Six hours, is that what I heard? Anyone else? The answer is 10 hours and 43 minutes. Now we can agree that 10 hours and 43 minutes is a ridiculous amount of time for a customer service rep to spend with a customer. But the thing to know about Zappos is this. In most companies, a customer service rep who spends almost 11 hours with a customer will get fired or disciplined, at best will have messed up all of their data for the entire year, things like call handle time data. What does Zappos do? Well, Zappos rolls out the PR machine. They interview the person, they put it up on YouTube, they promote it, you know, they, they're proud of this. Now, one of the things that we point out is that sometimes when I give this presentation, someone will say, yeah, but if they spend 11 hours with every customer, they go out of business. Yes, that is true but this is what we talk about with managing risk because it doesn't happen with every customer. Not every customer wants to spend 11 hours on the phone. Ritz-Carlton will pay, what, what do they give their employees? $600, the employee can spend $600 on any guest in any day to make things right. Is that the, the right amount? I think it is. If every employee does that every day, Ritz-Carlton goes out of business and yet this is a policy that works. And so we can't be afraid of extrapolating that great experience and its costs to everyone because not every customer is going to avail themselves of it. Nonetheless, resolving my needs when I ask powerful. So the next level up is provide what I need without me asking. Now we're getting to a really difficult level. In order to do this, you need to understand your customer. You need to understand what they want and need. You need to understand their different personas. In order to provide what they need without them asking, you need to know your customer better than the competition. This is why customer insight becomes so vital to doing experience design and CX right. So provide what I need without me asking. There are some great examples of this. Now, in my uh, flat tire example, might some of you pay more for a tire or a service that monitors when you're gonna have a flat tire and comes out and changes it automatically while you're asleep or at work so that you don't have a blowout when you're driving with your family? Maybe. You might not be that persona, who knows? But the point here is that this is a great experience. Now, there are brands that, uh, this is difficult to do, but there are brands that succeed at this. Um, Nest uh, took the most boring product in the world, a thermostat, something you throw on a wall and forget, and somehow made it sexy and interesting. And the reason is that Nest does what you need it to do without you needing to program it. Knows when you're home, raises the temperature, knows when you're away, lowers it so that you save money. A great example, and it is why Nest became so interesting to Google and why it got so much reputation in a field that hadn't done anything interesting in decades. Another example is the OnStar service in your car. Some of you have this, and you may think of it as a concierge service. You have a question, you hit the button, you ask a question, right? That's the responsiveness of OnStar. But OnStar also does something else, and that is if you have an accident, it evaluates the severity of the accident, and it can call for support and help even if you can't. Provide what I need without me asking. It's a very powerful level. Now, I want you to think about some of the brands you had in mind, because my guess is that you're gonna come up with examples of this. They knew you better, 
They did something before you asked for it. They offered something you needed or wanted. The product is something you needed or wanted. It's very powerful. But the next and top level is a really aspirational level, much like Maslow's hierarchy, and it's make me better, safer, or more powerful. Our research demonstrates that the most powerful experiences don't change the way people think about your brand. They change the way they think about themselves. Now, probably the classic example of this is Apple. Uh, there were smartphones before. Remember, we used to call them Crackberries. No one does that anymore. And that's because when Apple came out with the iPhone, it revolutionized the way people thought, not just about mobile computing, but about themselves. Make me better, safer, more powerful. They had their world in their hands. They had their friends, their communications. And now, how many of you, when you forget your phone at home, don't feel as safe? It's because it changed the way we think about ourselves. Now, there's a great quote on this. Michael Schrage from MIT is a fellow in the, at the MIT School of Management. And he says it's, uh, that long-term innovation success doesn't resolve around what the innovations do. It centers on what they invite customers to become. Again, an experience so powerful, it invites people to change the way they think about themselves. Now, I'm not saying every brand has an equal opportunity to that. I'm not suggesting we do that at every touch point. But what can we do if we, if we aspire to do that in key moments for key customers? What happens if we can achieve that? Now, this entire model might seem a little theoretical, but th we don't intend it to be used that way. This is the uh, uh, Gartner Customer Experience Journey model. Starts in the buy cycle, you know, typical sort of uh, marketing funnel ending when you acquire a customer. Then there's an own cycle. And if you do what's right, you should drive people to a strong state of love. And sometimes our Clients don't like the word love, it's too touchy-feely, so we'll say, okay, a strong sense of brand affinity means the same thing. And if you achieve that, you get two things. The first is that you begin to deepen the relationship, you get the loyalty loop. People begin to buy more, they churn less, they are interested in other products, so they have a broader breadth of products. Um, they're willing to pay more. I mentioned Apple earlier, Apple has the highest margin of any company in the United States. And it's because they have such rabid loyalty. And people will do all this without returning to the buy cycle. They don't rethink their needs. They don't relook at other opportunities or competing brands. If you're an Apple guy, you're an Apple guy or gal. You don't think about Android. Now, to the large extent, that's vice versa. But, and we can talk about the importance of locking people into your ecosystem. But nonetheless, the whole point here is that trying to gain loyalty is about keeping customers, having them spend more, not losing them and having them pay more, be willing to pay more. And all that's great if you provide the right experiences. But it also invites people who love the brand to become advocates. And advocacy is not a lucky happy, happenstance that happens. The strongest brands have a ladder of advocacy. They know what they can ask for first, they know what's next, they know what's next. Each step a little more difficult and complex than the rest so that you're beginning to welcome people through a simple to more complex ladder of advocacy, leading up to things like defending the brand against critics. Now, the point of all this is that as we map journeys with our clients, what we want to do is be asking, where are we today and where could we be in every point? Again, we're not trying to reach this uh, pinnacle across every step in this journey, but where do you have key moments? Where do you have opportunities to satisfy customer needs in a way that nobody is? And again, that returns us to understanding the customer better than the competition does. It's not about guessing. It's not about gambling or betting. This is about having the data to know. Now, the thing about this, too, is that it begins to change the way you think and act. It begins to change where you focus. So at the bottom here, we're really focused on tactics, right? How do we get information in people's hands? When they call, how do we respond to them? These are very tactical. But at the top, we're really being very strategic. What do people need? What do they want? How can we provide that? At the bottom, we're being reactive. We're waiting for people to arrive at our website or visit our Facebook page or pick up the phone and call us. At the top, we're being proactive. What do we know about our customers' wants and needs so that we can provide for them? At the bottom, we're really focused on things we have to do. We have to have content. We have to have content on our website. We have to have content for our mobile apps. We need content for Snapchat and for Instagram. Uh, we must have content, otherwise we evaporate. Uh, and we certainly have to pick up the phone every time it rings for us, or at least do a better job of that. 
So we're doing the things that we're committed to do already and improving those, but at the top, we're beginning to look more at products and innovations. You know, what is the product experience? What are the services that people get? How can we improve those things to make them more meaningful to people? And at the bottom, we're, what we're really doing is identifying dissatisfiers and solving those. What's wrong today? What do we need to do to fix that? But if you remove every dissatisfier, you don't create satisfaction. Satisfaction is something else. Think about those brands you had in your head again. Are they there only because they made things easier than anyone else? Or did they have special satisfiers, things that they did that were different? Apple didn't come out with just another smartphone that was marginally better than BlackBerry. They came out with something revolutionary. That was a satisfier. Amazon had one-click purchase, and it has Prime. It also has AWS. Innovation, different ways of satisfying different customers and different personas. So we, what we want to begin to do is realize that at the bottom, if all we do is figure out what's wor not working and trying to fix it, that's business as usual. We should improve what we are obligated to do. When it isn't right, we look for best practices. We look around over our shoulder and we see what everyone else is doing. We try to learn from them. And as a result, it's very safe, but completely undifferentiated. But at the top, we're being differentiated. We're not doing business as usual. We're leading. What are, uh, compared to our competition. And in the end, we're being risky. And we have to steer into that. This is one of the things that gets in the way of innovation success and CX success. So what we want to do is not avoid risk, but steer into it and manage it. So what I want to do is share four examples of brands that have uh, avoided risk and managed it and what they did to do that. The first is to acquire data and insight. The more you know, the less risky it is. Um, Procter & Gamble. Uh, one of the things that is the most risky things that companies do is to do a product launch. We all realize that. Too many product launches fail. And when you think about the amount of time it takes, the amount of money we put into it, it's just ridiculous how many products fail. So Procter & Gamble began to consider the Tide Pod. And one of the things that they found is that they did research and they found that most people were pretty satisfied with the amount of time and effort they put into the laundry using liquid detergent. 68% of people said they were satisfied. But when they began to test the Tide Pod, what they found is that satisfaction with the time and effort went up to 97%. So they began to have the information they needed to give them confidence that this is a product that would work. I'll return to them again at the end, by the way, and we'll talk about how it worked. Um, expand your vision. One of the things that our data demonstrates is that the more expansive your customer journey map, the more successful it is likely to be. Organizations make the mistake of ending their customer journey map at acquisition. The buying journey drives me crazy. Sometimes they use it when the, the customer uses the product. You saw our journey map. It continues onward. What is the journey to satisfaction and love? What is the journey to loyalty and advocacy? Understanding that gives you opportunities you don't otherwise see. But we also mean it the other way, on the beginning of the journey. So too often organizations start their journey map where they believe the journey begins, and they're wrong. So let me give you an example because I used Lyft on the way here today. The point about Uber and Lyft is that taxis thought their journey started right here in this step. And this step is where I'm at the most busy streets in the city or at the airport or at the train station, and that's where they're going to pick me up. What did Uber and Lyft do? Well, Uber and Lyft took a few more steps before that. You know, now you can call your transportation to where you are. You can see where the car is. You can know that you're going to get a driver that's highly rated. And so by the time you actually step in the vehicle, you've done a whole bunch of steps that have extended the journey and offered you value that allowed them to capture very rapidly a lion's share of the business away from this protected uh, marketplace of taxi companies. Now, we can talk about a lot of the other things they did, such as completely ignore laws, we can also talk about the fact they continue to lose money. They just announced a billion dollar quarterly loss. So they did other things as well. God only knows how they're going to succeed in the future. Nonetheless, extending the journey allowed them with almost no marketing cost to acquire customers rapidly. At one time, Uber said that, that for every seven rides people took, they got one more referred paying customer. And so that's the question is, how can you provide an experience so great that for every seven experiences you provide people, they want to tell somebody else about it? 
Now, another thing to do is to align to organizational and customer strategies. Now, that might seem the antithesis to innovation, aligning to existing strategies. But let's look at USAA. In fact, let's start someplace else really rapidly. I get a lot of calls from financial services firms at Gartner, and they have put a lot of money and effort into Alexa skills that nobody is using. Zero usage. Voice is the future. How many times have you heard that in the last months online, right? Voice is the future. Well, the thing about this is that it was a solution in search of a problem. When we bank, we bank privately. You don't scream out your balances in the middle of your home. You don't want your balances announced, or God forbid your late payments announced, so that your friends and your neighbors can hear it. We bank quietly. Now, our behaviors may change someday around this. We recognize that. But for now, this was not the right innovation. So let's look at USAA. USAA became the first company to offer mobile deposit that was automated. And they did it not at a time when people were asking for it. They didn't trust their phone to do this. The thing that USAA knew is, if you know USAA, that they've always had a strategy that they need to execute. They are a branchless bank, and that means deposits are difficult. And so in the PC area, they allowed people to use flatbed scanners, and the second phones had the cameras and the safety that were acceptable. They extended that onto the phone. Now, it looked innovative. For them, it was just an extension of something they'd always done, but they made everyone chase them. So finding innovations that meet existing organizational strategies is a way of being effective in reducing risk. Finally, pilot, test, and repeat. Have a test and learn culture. We'll end here with Procter & Gamble and the Tide Pod. By the time the Tide Pod came out, Procter & Gamble had tested it with over 6,000 customers. They were very confident it would be effective, and it was. Immediately won a 73% share of market in the unit dose market, which is twice its market share in liquid detergent. So ways of reducing risk. We should steer into risk, not be afraid of it. Otherwise, we can't be innovative. Which brings us to our last challenge. Let's say you do all these things. You, get, you know the customer better than anyone else. You map those journeys. You use the pyramid. You find those really proactive experiences. You still have one more problem, and that is that proactive experiences don't always hit the bullseye immediately. We talked about... P&G and the Tide Pod and its immediate success, which is great, but a lot of innovations take time, and we recognize this. Facebook lost a lot of money before it began to make a lot of money. Does anyone know how much Amazon, so every retailer in the world wants to be Amazon today, right? Anyone know how much money Amazon lost before it made its first dollar? Three billion dollars. Now, I'm not suggesting that your brand go and lose $3 billion. Please don't go back to your bosses and say, Gartner says to do that. But the point is, is that this is a wild example to represent something that happens every day with every innovation that we make, which is we can't always expect innovations to work immediately, so we need a different way of measuring them. Now, our pyramid is three sides. Each of the sides have a different way of measuring in order, adoption, perception, and financial. Now, what we mean by this is that adoption begins to demonstrate if what you do is adopted, that suggests that it is providing value to your customers. They want to continue using it. It also suggests future value for your organization. Again, we can look at the early losses of Amazon and maybe Snapchat, of Uber, of Facebook, and their valuations went through the roof because of adoption. And so the market recognizes that adoption is powerful. We need to help our bosses realize that as well. Adoption can be things like the active user, monthly active users. It can be user growth. It can be repeat users, which is a great example. I had a financial services organization that produced a mobile application for a very particular sort of client, not a huge client base. And what they found is that they didn't start having millions of downloads, but the people who did download it kept opening the app. So unlike almost every other mobile app, which gets abandoned after one to three uses, their app was continually being used by a small set of customers. This told them that they were on to something. This told them that if we could promote it more, if we could improve it more, it's providing value, it is worth investing in. So they use the adoption data to get more investment. Next is perception. As people use this new exciting innovation of yours, is it changing perception or not? Are people more satisfied? Do they trust more? Are they more likely to buy? These all begin to tell you that your experience is having an impact across the entire brand, even if you can't quite yet demonstrate ROI about that experience. 
Once again, my financial services brand began to measure perception. And what they found is that the people who were the active users of this application were far more likely to be NPS promoters. And this began to tell them that they were on to something. Over time, what they began to find, by the way, is that the people who were using this application also churned much less than the people who didn't. Now again, we're not even talking about ROI just yet. We're talking about different ways to know that your experience is having an impact on the brand. And then finally, there's financial. But even here, we don't have to talk about ROI. ROI is certainly one of the ways that you can measure financially, but there's other ways as well. Are people using this uh, innovative experience? Are they buying more? Are they churning less? Are they buying different sorts of products? Are they referring more business? So here's one of the interesting things that I think it, to, that makes this case is Amazon Prime. Certainly a powerful driver for Amazon, correct? On paper, it loses money. Amazon does not charge enough for Amazon Prime subscriptions to pay it back for all the free shipping and all the free content they provide. So they should stop doing it, right? It doesn't have positive ROI. Well, they know that it has a financial impact in other ways. They know that their customers who are Prime members buy twice as often, two to three times as often as non-Prime members. And when they do buy, their average cart value is twice as great as non-Prime members. And so they can begin to see that Prime is having an impact beyond just the directly, narrowly attributable value that it delivers. Now, ultimately, the point of all three of these measures is to use them to get patience, patience for something that needs time to develop and to secure budget, budget to further develop it. Now, I'm going to end with Amazon as well. And this is interesting to me. Bezos, Jeff Bezos, very famous, he has said, you know, we are really stubborn. We wait five to seven years how things work, to see how things work out. Wouldn't that be great to, to produce something and then not be held accountable at all for five to seven years? You know, I could get to retirement that way. I could launch something tomorrow and not have anyone know it didn't work for five to seven years. I'd be retired. Now, of course, that's ridiculous. We know Jeff Bezos doesn't do this. Sounds good. Good PR. And in fact, we have evidence of this. Uh, the Amazon Fire phone came and went in about 16 months. Where was the stubbornness? Where was all this patience? Why didn't they keep throwing money down a hole for five to seven years to find out what happens? And it's because the adoption, the perception, and the financial measures weren't there. It was not being adopted enough. People who were using the phone weren't finding it sufficiently uh, differentiated. And ultimately, they were concerned it was never going to produce financial results. So they pulled the plug. That is the power of these measures. So I'm going to end by saying that all of the things that we talk to our clients about and all the things we've discussed today are designed to get you to be bolder, to reach for the ring, and to help your bosses to do that. Because chances are you in this room are pretty bold to begin with. And so we'll just wrap up, and then we'll take a little time for Q&A. But where to start? I've said it a number of times. Uh, customer insight. Know your customer better than your competition. Really understand them. Don't just understand what's not working. Understand what the unmet needs and expectations are. Understand their motivations. Look at the trends in their behaviors. Data is the lifeblood. Complete your customer journey maps. Really do a good job of that end-to-end -end journey. Understand at the very first place when people have a need, expand your journeys, and make sure to continue those journeys, not till somebody is using a product, but until they are very satisfied, willing to be loyal. What are the steps you need to take to get people there? Because those get ignored. And last, measure across these three categories and prepare your bosses to measure across these categories. Don't promise ROI. Promise that you're going to measure adoption and show that people are using this experience. Promise you're going to measure perception and demonstrate that this experience is having an impact on people's perception of the entire brand. And finally, get around to financial last. And with that, I thank you. I appreciate your time. I hope this has been interesting, and I look forward to continuing the dialogue both here and hopefully on Twitter if you are so inclined. Thank you. So at this time, we have uh, time for just a couple of questions. Uh, if anyone would like to ask anything directly, I would uh, definitely en encourage you to, to do so. Feel free to raise your hand. I'll bring you the mic. And again, the mic is more for the video than it is necessarily for the room. So just open it up to the room at this time. Hold on. <laughs> um, who are your three companies? So you asked us to think of three. Oh, that's, that's off a, the top of our head. At the that's beginning. great. Um, 
You know, the funny thing is that I have three companies that I'm not a customer of. So USA would be one of the customers. Uh, I am not a vet, nor were my parents, so I got to experience USAA as an employee. And by the way, they're as great a company on the inside as they are from the outside. Um, so they always come to mind. Um, I would mention Amazon, and believe it or not, for as much Amazon love as I gave here today, I'm boycotting Amazon for several reasons. I mean, everyone's sort of got their reasons. I, I think the HQ pursuit is annoying. I think the fact that this is a company that makes $5.6 billion and doesn't pay a dime of federal taxes. Meanwhile, they're about to get $3 billion of taxpayer-funded subsidies to build their headquarters. Um, if you follow what's going on with some of their warehouse workers, they recently announced their increasing pay, but some of their warehouse workers report that they're urinating in bottles because they're worried about being uh, held accountable for lost time and efficiency see if they actually go to the restroom. And none of which is even to point out, and this gets a little political, that they continue to support InfoWars uh, by having an InfoWars store. And so I'm boycotting them. I still respect them. I still respect the things they've done, but I'm waiting for them to be as good a corporate citizen as they are a retailer. Um, so the only thing I'll say is that I did advocate for uh, the She the People, so that might be one of those experiences. Um, I'm a big fan of Anchor, if you're not familiar with them, A-N-K-E-R. They've got great batteries and, and charging devices. I tend to advocate for them. And they do something I find really fascinating. Not only do they have a wonderful product, I've bought from them frequently, but when you get their product, there's a little card in it with, that's folded over. And one side says, um, happy, question mark, and the other side says, problems. And if you turn it to the happy side, it invites you to connect with them on social media and to rate them. And if you turn it over on the other side and open it up, it gives all their customer service information so that you can get the support you need. Pretty simple, but it seems like a really easy thing that a lot of brands simply overlook. So how do you really feel about Amazon? <laughs> the problem is, is that uh, Jet and Boxed and some of the others do not provide the same experience that Amazon provides. And so I would love to have them change a little bit and win me back. But uh, I think there are more people growing more concerned with Amazon. Uh, a year ago when I started this, people thought I was crazy. This year, suddenly, I'm getting more people who are uh, signing on to it. So, uh, you know, think about your impact on the larger world and whether Amazon is worthy of your support. One more question. Anyone? Yeah, could you just go down a level in customer journey maps and maybe give a, an anonymous example of, of a map that really sort of made a discovery that actually had a very you know, fruitful result? Yeah, let's go to that slide really quick. One moment. Thought I was hitting the right button, ended up on the wrong slide. All right, so um, what's interesting is that when we work with our clients with this, what we generally find is that there's not a lot of ahas through this section. Everyone's worried about this section right here, aware, evaluate, select, and purchase. Everyone's focused on that. What can we do about conversion rate? If we personalize a little more, we'll get better conversion rate. We need better offers all through here. Here and here is where we see a lot of problems, and we often find organizations that are really not focused on need and discovery. What's going on in the customer's life when they discover they have a need or where they are open to discovering the solution that you provide? Uh, and then the other thing is that organizations just really don't manage this. All the measures that we see are for purchase. They're really not over here in the receive on board and use. Now, to answer your specific question, we worked with a B2B company. And one of the things that they realized very quickly when we looked at their data, and they had never, they were all focused, you know, they were losing customers, but they wanted to really focus on growth and get uh, a lot of energy through here. But we said, you know, to grow, you can't shovel in as many customers as you're losing. And so let's explore what happens here. And they were a subscription model. And what they found is that they had data that demonstrated that in the onboarding experience, that they could tell at the three month mark with something like 85% uh, um, confidence whether the customer would renew or not at the 12 month mark. So they already by onboarding had 85% of the experience set that would determine whether people got here and renewed or not. And so this was really telling for them. They didn't realize that. They thought, you know, we're gonna focus on the one year. What does everyone do when, in a subscription model, right? Well, what, what do we need to do three months before? What do we need to do two months before? What do we need to do one month before? All of those sort of sales and renewal tactics. 85% was explained in the onboarding. So the data demonstrated that they knew that if they could get people to do five things, 
And if they did those five things, they were almost assuredly going to renew nine months later. And so this was an aha for them. And so what we began to do was focus on what was preventing them from doing those five things. Something as simple as creating a profile on their, their, uh, on their network, on their system. And so what we began to do is really focus on those behaviors. And that was a real aha for them here. And they realized that onboarding wasn't one step. They thought it was one step. They sent an email. We've onboarded people. We've welcomed them. We've given them 12 links that they can use. Now they're onboarded, patting themselves on the back. And they realized that onboarding was a whole series of steps and that the steps actually had uh, a flowchart. Have they done this? Yes or no? If yes, have them do that. If no, then we need to do something else. And so one of the things that they ended up deploying that was really interesting is they put very little effort into onboarding. Their client success people did very little around onboarding. They really were customer care people. They, they picked up the phone when they called. And what they began to deploy is their customer care people, I'm sorry, their uh, customer success people uh, in a stage. If this happened and that happened and that happened, it triggers that we need to call out. Uh, and as a result, they were able to have a significant impact on satisfaction and, and as a result then on renewal. And so this was interesting and it was a different use of data than they had ever did. And they, they did push, shift a great deal of focus from here where they pretty were, were pretty effective. Most organizations are great at lead generation and management and rating those leads and getting them to purchase uh, into something they weren't so good at, which is these first couple of really key steps.